Welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project's fourth branch podcast series. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project's Tech Roundup podcast, part of RTP's fourth branch podcast series. My name is Jack Derwin, and I'm Assistant Director of RTP at the Federal Society. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Ryan Hageman and Joseph McKinney to discuss the Catawba Digital Economic Zone. Ryan, who will be our moderator today, is co-director of the IBM Policy Lab. He was previously a senior fellow at the International Center for Law and Economics, as well as at the Niskanen Center, and his policy expertise focuses on the regulatory governance of emerging technologies. Joe is CEO of the Catawba Digital Economic Zone and a leading expert in the governance as a service industry, which aims to improve governmental services through special economic zones and distributed ledger technologies. To view their full bios, you can visit regproject.org. As always, all expressions of opinion on today's podcast are those of our speakers. Without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Ryan. All right. Thanks a bunch, Jack. And thanks to you, Joe, for joining me to chat about an exciting bit of news that's largely flown under the radar over the past two months. Uh, and that is the announcement of the first digital economic zone in the United States. So originally approved by the Catawba Nations General Council back on February 19th, the Catawba Digital Economic Zone is essentially an independent administrative jurisdiction governing digital asset management, fintech, and cryptocurrencies located within the Catawba Nation in South Carolina. And as the original press release, press release notes, quote, using a model similar to Estonia's e-residency, after completing the know your customer requirements, anyone in the world will be able to set up an e-corporation online in the zone and take advantage of policies and regulations that allow them to safely manage their digital assets, raise investment capital, and offer digital banking services. So with that high-level background under our belt, let's jump over to you, Joe. And I want to start off by asking you to kind of give us your own overview of what the Catawba Digital Economic Zone is and the history of how this all came to fruition. For sure. Yeah, I think it, sometimes I like to explain it in a little bit of a narrative and then it gets to the wider picture of what it is um, as it unfolds. So uh, I first want to uh, say that the Catawba, they're my boss. This is their project. I just have the pleasure and the honor to be able to lend some expertise I've developed over the years in special economic zones and distributed ledger technologies to make it happen. And uh, they were pursuing a special economic zone project starting six years ago. And for the first three years, they weren't able to come to an exact structure to make it profitable and understandable uh, uh, for investors. Um, so they brought us on board because they knew of, uh, of our work at the, at the Startup Society Foundation in our nonprofit work. So I came onto this project and I was looking at this opportunity like many people in the United States and simply said, yeah, this sounds interesting, but I don't know how this would work. Aren't Native Americans paper tigers? Um, but the more you dig into it, you actually find out it's the exact opposite. Uh, uh, American Indians, uh, uh, through their tribal governments, have the same authority as a rule of thumb uh, as American states and sometimes even higher. The only reason that they haven't reached that, uh, that threshold of, of authority and, and influence is because of capital and a lack of, uh, of structure that can uh, you know, make it effective and, and, and profitable and scalable. And that's precisely what this zone does. It creates a correct structure that can attract capital um, that allows people to interface with Native American governments, not in the way that they are today, which is namely one-off examples of jurisdictional arbitrage, such as gaming or lending or cannabis or what have you, but as a true jurisdiction. Um, so we were brought on board to sort of structure that and specifically how that could be brought with something that has, has high profit potential, namely digital assets. And also it's a space that just isn't well regulated. So uh, last year, we actually, uh, me and my wife, we actually moved down to South Carolina to work with the nation's attorneys, both on uh, the business arm, as well as with their nation's attorneys and their outside counsel with uh, large prestigious uh, uh, Indian law firms uh, like Hobbs Strauss to work on a piece of legislation. And so we went through the process of, of going back and forth on how that structure would work, conducting feasibility studies, and finally got an approval 
uh, uh, for the legislation and even secured a uh, special meeting with the general counsel. And in parallel to that, uh, we were, uh, you know, conducting community engagement. So going door to door, you know, meeting people at, at Golden Corral for dinner and for coffee, sending printed materials, doing Zoom meetings, et cetera, basically just doing everything in, in our power to make sure that the message was out there about the zone so that the, the Catawba people would be uh, educated about what they would be voting on on February 19th. And so uh, we had the meeting, there was uh, final discussions, and then it was overwhelmingly voted by the Catawba people. And what they voted on was essentially a, a special jurisdiction with its own commercial code with a regulatory body called the Zone Authority, which creates regulations on top of it and registers companies similar to Delaware or Nevada or what have you through our, uh, our digital platform and uh, is able to be governed there at the same level of a state and many times higher. So that's the thousand foot view and sort of the, the, the general story. Great. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it sounds like a, it's a pretty unique story. And I, I think what's, what's interesting to me is maybe maybe kind of getting an understanding of maybe the broader, more global, more historical landscape here, because this sounds like such a unique story. I'm wondering that whether or not there are sort of any foreign or historical analogs to something like this. So anything in the past or anything currently in existence. And in particular, when I, when I think of this digital economic zone, my mind immediately drifts towards kind of modern developments in institutional governance, like charter cities and Chinese special economic zones. Is that is that a fair character characterization here, or, or is this something fundamentally different from anything that we've seen before? So the most unique thing about an iPhone isn't the camera, it isn't the phone, it isn't the browser. It's combining all those things together. So in this sense, it is unique. This is the first digital economic zone within the United States, especially done so under the sovereignty of a Native American tribe. But you are correct. A lot of the individual bits and pieces have been done in the United States or abroad. For instance, a lot of the regulations that we'll be pushing forward on are done by the state of Wyoming. Of course, we will further than them and improve upon uh, you know what they have already done. Like for instance, we'll have a best class commercial code from day one, which uh, uh, you know not necessarily Wyoming has in a lot of cases. And it doesn't go as far as it can um, because of it. They have special interests that they have to contend to in the banking industry or securities or what have you. Um, also. Uh, there are, you know, uh, you know, Native American tribes that have done individual things with regulating and have commercial codes, but they haven't, you know, put it all together like we have in terms of a jurisdiction. And like you've mentioned, there are special economic zones abroad uh, that have experimented with similar things. I would say the closest analog would be the Dubai International Financial Center, uh, which is a leading special economic zone in Dubai that is privately run, uh, though it is publicly owned, but it's run as a for-profit corporation you can see on Crunchbase. Um, but it's actually a relatively small plot of land. Um, I think it's like 193 acres or something like that. Um, but its main arbitrage is that it has clear and simple and streamlined rules for financial companies. And that's specifically helpful in, uh, in, in the Middle East where they have a lot of Sharia compliant laws that you know, prohibit usury. Um, so I would say that is a pretty big you know, and similar example. Yeah, great. And, and you know, it, it leads me sort of, I think, naturally in, into my next question, um, which is, you know, given that given that there are, are other things like this in the world right now, but also given the fact that we kind of have existing regulatory institutions in this country and at, at the international level, and, you know, specifically, I think of, say, like the SEC here in, in the U.S. Or, or OCC and Treasury, but then at the international level, I think you also have um, you know, FinCEN. And so there are, there are layers of regulatory governance already in place at, at multiple levels of governance in the world. So I guess the question that, that dovetails a little bit off of that is, why is something like this, at least in your mind, necessary in, in, in this current state and time? Well, I would say there is existing regulatory frameworks, but there is a lack of clarity about this particular uh, industry, digital assets, how it's classified under existing law and how it's classified under regulations. And I would say a lot of these regulators are not against the idea of experimenting with digital assets. They simply can't find a way to safe, safely yet nimbly uh, create this sort of sandbox. This is precisely what we're doing. We're creating a sandbox where we're dovetailing digital assets under existing law and, and giving it a little bit breathing room while providing a lot of compliance and and and, and working with 
regulators and collaborating with them as a, as a, uh, you know, on behalf of a sovereign entity like the Catawba, that's precisely our strategy. Now, when you're sovereign, um, uh, to a certain extent, you don't have to, you know, work with, uh, with, with other sovereigns in the area. For instance, uh, you know, uh, the, tr- the tribe is on equal foot with, uh, with other states, yet it makes good sense to be on good terms with those states. And uh, tribes are sovereign in the United States. Ultimately, Congress is, uh, has ultimate authority over them, what they call plenary authority, but they have a lot of room there. But the point being is there's, we should always have good neighbors. And by creating good collaboration, you can create a sort of a, a sandbox situation that they want, but they currently aren't able to because of their slow moving organizations. Um, federal regulators, um, they, they want innovation, but they don't know, they don't have a way that they can nimbly and safely have this sort of sandbox uh, uh, type of situation. What this provides is precisely that, that allows uh, regulators to dovetail digital assets and fintech into existing law in a compliant manner. Yeah, I think that, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I, I, I guess here's where I, I might push back a little bit, and I, I want to get your thoughts on Sort of a, a potential, maybe a potential critique, but I, I think this is more kind of identifying near 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 term problems with something like like the Catawba Digital Economic Zone. So you have on one hand certain regulators who, to your point, they want to be nimble, they want to be pro innovation, and they want to do it all with a respectful balance, uh, you know, being mindful of you know consumer protection and, and things like that. But you also have regulators who maybe. Uh, when they're doing that balancing act on the scales in their mind, they're actually weighted a little bit less being nimble and being pro sandbox and, you know, pro, you know, innovation. So one problem I could foresee is how the Catawba Digital Economic Zone's authority potentially intersects with federal regulators currently tussling over digital asset regulation. So I'm thinking the SEC, CFTC, Treasury, CFPB maybe, and, and, and others. There's a lot of financial regulators in the U.S., right? From your perspective, working on this project, is that sort of a realistic concern? Is that a near-term problem? And how do you see the Catawba Digital Economic Zone fitting into the existing regulatory apparatus in the U.S., if at all? Well, so like I said before, uh, a, a Native American tribe has the same status as a U.S. state, but a U.S. state can do significantly a lot in terms of regulations re- regarding digital assets and banking and, 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 all, and all the things around it, as states like Wyoming have, have demonstrated. But even Wyoming uh, uh, cannot go far as it, as it can, not for legal reasons, but for political reasons. Because if they move too far in one direction, their existing bank charters, for instance, wouldn't be too favorable for it. That was uh, that, that Some people have speculated that's the reason why they have 100% reserve banks for their special depository institutions to custody crypto. Not because of any legal reasons or even any ideological reasons, but because of they, there's a there's there's special interests that wouldn't want them to 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 be able to lend based on deposit. So it, we would fit at around that same level. Uh, and so in terms of you know dealing with regulators, based on the conversations that we have had with regulators, uh, I do think they're open. I think one of the core differences. This actually seems strangely uh, personal um, because you you imagine regulators to be almost robotic, right? I I think one thing that is actually really key is is coming humbly and respectfully to talking with regulators. And there's been some other states um, that have not been as respectful or humble when they come to the table to talk about these these types of arbitrage opportunities and what they're planning to do. And as a consequence, they create this animosity that wouldn't exactly exist just because of the policies that are on the table, but just because of the tone of it. And I know that sounds a little bit ridiculous, but it's true. And ultimately, that's the whole philosophy here, that we want to be good partners. And we already see that uh, starting to bear fruit. I, I think that makes a lot of sense, right? I, I think sort of the 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 inverse of sort of the approach you all have been taking is sort of the way that Uber tried to kind of circumvent existing rules and regulations in in standing up its company, right? And for all the for all the benefits that you know Uber has brought to the world, obviously it's it's created you know certain back end headaches for them, um, you know after they've after they've emerged into the market and and you know have become something of a political football. Um, so I, I want to play devil's advocate for a second, um, because given how new this all is, there's not, shall we say, an industry of opposition as we find in, in, in other 
in other sectors and in other policy debates, right? So I want to I want to offer uh, one theoretical criticism that I could imagine people bringing to bear on something like this, um, and it's that. Uh, the Catawba Digital Economic Zone goes something like this. The Catawba Digital Economic Zone is essentially an end run around the government's legitimate authority to regulate and police digital assets. And that the zone essentially leaves consumers unprotected from risks that are better managed by federal regulatory agencies that have a lot of in-house you know, experience and expertise and a historical culture that makes them well-suited to essentially address problems that emerge when consumers are, you know, fleeced by scams or, or things of that nature. How would you respond to a criticism that's levied against the zone that essentially relies on that sort of consumer protection argument? I would say the exact opposite. This is first and foremost, this is not a way to avoid the federal government or or, or, or the government in, in, in financial matters. This is a, this is a way to create jurisdiction, which is a government that is compliant with federal law and is specifically geared towards, yes, creating uh, a space for innovation within digital assets, but mostly clarifying where it is under existing law, including consumer protections. And one way is that, uh, that we want to provide that is to make sure that bad actors don't enter the space. Unlike other states like Delaware or Wyoming, we're going to be requiring KYC and AML for anyone that's registering a company within the zone. And that by itself will reduce the amount of uh, possible infractions within our ecosystem and create more trust in other ones. Because in order to get into this ecosystem, you have to be thoroughly vetted in order to make sure that you, you do so. And we'll make sure to collaborate with regulators and, and other consumer protection laws that that other uh, uh, um, that uh, other regulators have to push forth. Um, so no, this is not a way to, to work around the government. In fact, this is this is a way to use technology to become even more compliant and make sure that there are, is more respect for these consumer protections. Got it. You know, I, I remember a number of years ago, Mark Andreessen wrote an op-ed for Politico that discussed the idea of creating sort of a plenitude of Silicon Valleys around the country based on new emerging technologies and sectors. So in other words, creating zones of regulatory arbitrage, like we've been talking about, where states and municipalities could be uh, more incentivized to create competing zones of technology ecosystems. So you think of like a drone valley in, in Detroit or an autonomous vehicle valley uh, in Seattle, as opposed to kind of replicating the software-based ecosystem that's emerged in Silicon Valley. Do you see this zone as the first among many other digital asset zones? And could this translate into other industry-specific special economic zones in the future if successful? So, yeah, I do agree with with his take that Silicon Valley is unbundling. It's not a place. It's more uh, of an idea or or for a particular industry. It's an it's a individual place. Um, I will probably put a stake in the ground that this is going to be the most competitive jurisdiction for especially for digital assets. Um, and part of that is because, uh, you know, unlike a lot of jurisdictions, we're operating very similar to a network effect. We're, we're going to have, we are, we do have a digital platform like a, like a, um, like, you know, social networks do. Um, so we do have an effect technologically that uh, incentivizes other people to join the network. And also because of our legal system, it, there is an incentive for companies that are operating within the zone to do business with other companies that are within the zone, you know, causing, you know, more and more people to want to join. And I would say one of our core competitive advantages here is not even what we have on day one, which is great, but the structure of it, because U.S. states, they have legislators, they have uh, they have uh, at least hundreds of thousands of citizens, if not millions of citizens that they have to contend with, and businesses that have sometimes existed for, for hundreds of years. Um, they're not able to move quickly in industries like this versus the zone. They have a commission of regulators that's a five-person board in order to create these regulations. So even if, let's say, Wyoming was to come up with a, with a new law and they were talking about it with their, uh, uh, with their blockchain committee and they go out to lunch, um, we could potentially be in that room or be watching the live stream. And by the time that they come back from lunch, we could have it implemented into regulation. So no matter what good law or regulation uh, another jurisdiction could put forth, we can, we can implement it and we can always move quicker. So that, that leads me into sort of my penultimate question, which is what's next for the Catawba Digital Economic Zone? You've got it set up. 
you've got things kind of up and running. You have some initial interest. Um, you know, you have a mission, you have a vision, you have, uh, you know, essentially a jurisdiction, if you will. Um, so, so what happens now? Give us kind of the timeline on how you see this developing over the next one, five, and maybe 10 years, if we want to go with that trifecta. Absolutely. So uh, where we are right now is that we have built out all the, the, the handbooks and, and operating materials for employees to start regulating and registering companies. And right now we're in the process of identifying hires to be regulators within the zone. And this goes to your question about legitimacy. We are seeking candidates that are established regulators, people that would be respected by state, federal, and international regulators from around the world. Um, so hopefully within uh, the next couple of months, we'll be registering companies and, and issuing regulations about the digital asset industry. We just had our Zone Authority Commission meet for the first time a week ago, and they just adopted a chair, and, and soon we'll be establishing the, the, the bylaws of uh, the Zone Authority. Um, and where I see us in the first you know, year or so is, is, is kind of like Uber, you know, why would people jump into a stranger's car at first was the first question. It seems strange. Um, and then the question then became, why would you ever get into a, get into a cab? Uh, and, and the question is, you know, the learning process of people getting acclimated to a seemingly strange idea, but just makes sense, especially with, with good execution and, and building trust over time. So that's where we're going to be. We're going to be in a process of like, okay, do we go to Delaware or do we go with this new zone? Uh, and then over time, I think we're going to be able to, to disrupt that market entirely. Yeah, well, going with the Uber example, I, I can definitely say it'll be an interesting future. I would say if you had asked me 10 years ago if I anticipated the future I'm living in right now, here and today, I, I probably would have said, no, absolutely not. So it's it's interesting how quickly, to your point, people can get acclimatized to, you know, new things that previously were thought undoable and, and un, unthinkable. Um, so I guess to, to close us out, do you have any closing thoughts or comments for the folks listening? So I would just say, if you want to get involved, come and uh, check out katabadigital.zone. I, I feel like a lot of these listeners are, are super interested in the intersection of law, regulation, and technology. So we'd love to get your feedback as well um, and see if we could partner with all, um, any of you. Because if uh, what we need right now is uh, is is people that are knowledgeable about this topic to give uh, to give us feedback as we develop our regulations. Uh, you know, to bring in partners that that are interested in registering in the zone. So yeah, just any expertise you coming our way as we're developing our zone authority. That's something that we'd really appreciate. Great, I think you hit the uh, the audience here. You know exactly, and uh, feedback is a gift, and a stranger is just a friend you haven't met yet. So. Joe, uh, interested in seeing how this initiative thrives and evolves in the coming years. And with that, thanks so much for taking the time to chat. It's been a pleasure. Of course. Thank you so much, Ryan. And thanks for uh, putting us on the show. Of course. Thank you so much for joining us, Joe. And thank you for hosting today, Ryan. This is it'll be absolutely fascinating to see what's next for the, uh, the Catawba Digital Economic Zone. And thank you to our audience for tuning in to this episode of RTP's Tech Roundup podcast. You can subscribe on any major podcast platform and check out our website at rightproject.org or our social media accounts at FedSocRTP to stay up to date. Thank you. Federal Society's Regulatory Transparency Project, thanks for tuning in to the Fourth Branch Podcast. To catch every new episode when it's released, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spreaker. For the latest from RTP, please visit our website at regproject.org. That's R-E-G project.org. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 